Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Dr. Jamie Seaman, and she'll be speaking in our conference in February. Jamie is one of our triple threat speakers with a passion for fitness, nutrition, and science. So how's it going today, Jamie? Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's wonderful. Yeah, uh, thanks for being here. I know uh, between our busy schedules, it was a bit of a challenge, but here we are. Yes, this is uh, this worked out great, and I can't wait to be out in Denver in February. Excellent. Well, Dr. Seaman is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist, author, speaker, athlete, business owner, mother, and wife. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition, Exercise, and Health Sciences, and is a fellow in Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. She has a passion for fitness, preventive medicine, and ketogenic therapy, not only in her medical practice, but in her own life. She was Miss Nebra Mrs. Nebraska of 2020. On social media, Jamie goes by the handle, Dr. Fit and Fabulous, and her new book is titled Hard to Kill. These titles certainly tell us a lot about her ethos. Jamie exudes passion, confidence, and commitment. So Jamie, if you can provide some more background and tell us about your professional and personal interests. Yeah, so I, I'm in Nebraska. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. I work full-time as a private practice OBGYN. I know there's a lot of social media doctors that don't even see patients anymore, but I, I'm a full-time practicing clinician. And my story a little bit prior to becoming a doctor was I was a collegiate athlete and, you know, loved sports and athletics. Uh, apparently my, my dogs would like to chime in too on the podcast. That's fine. We love dogs. <laughs> um, and so this is real life, you guys. Okay. Um, Hey, Rex, Roscoe, come here. So, and so I, I was a collegiate athlete and I met my husband in college and wanted to go to medical school. And we went to medical school and moved up here to Omaha and we wanted to start a family. And this was the first shift in my life where I was going from being very physically active. I mean, I don't want to say forced to be physically active, but when you're in sports, right, you're constantly practicing and training and weightlifting and doing all these things. And now I'm suddenly sedentary. I'm sitting in a classroom for long periods of time, taking tests on the weekends, and I wasn't forced to work out and nobody was standing over my shoulder, looking at my nutrition and what I was eating, you know, anymore. And, uh, it's kind of like when you leave your parents' house for the first time. Right. Um, and I started to struggle a little bit with my health. I was having trouble maintaining my weight. I was having, and all I knew was just count calories just, and I was literally counting goldfish crackers. I talk about it in my book and here's somebody with a nutrition degree in the middle of medical training. And this is what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm counting goldfish crackers. So, um, I had three pregnancies during my pregnancies, failed my glucose testing after my pregnancies was diagnosed with prediabetes and hypothyroidism, which from the outside, I don't think anybody, any doctor would have ever looked at me and said, oh, she looks very metabolically unhealthy. <laughs> um, and it just really started to open my eyes to think about what does that look like, right? We think about this phenotype of a patient that's like obese or you know, has acanthosis, like these classic clinical signs and symptoms. But what I realized was there are so many people just like myself running around that look like maybe they have a normal weight from the outside. Uh, maybe they have a normal waist circumference, you know, all these markers that we use and they have this horrible burning metabolic disease deep down inside. So it really set me on this personal path of figuring out what we're doing wrong in medicine. And it really brought me back to the basics the food that we eat, the way we move, the way we sleep. I went back and did an integrative medicine fellowship um, because I felt like I wanted other tools as well for my patients, not just here, take this metformin, you know, eat less, move more. Um, and so I practice a lot differently than a lot of my colleagues, but I deliver babies, I do surgery, and I do a lot of lifestyle counseling um, in my practice for a variety of women's health, you know, uh, reasons. And also, just chronic disease prevention. That's great, Jamie. And so like yourself, I'm I'm working in medicine. I'm still uh, in the system trying to bring about change. And we need more healthcare professionals like us to uh, not throw in the towel, to, to, but to bring about change from the, from the inside. And I, I hope that you continue to enjoy what you do and bring about that change. It is really fulfilling, actually. I um, When you get to 
deprescribed medications, when you get to hear patients come in and talk about the things that they're able to do, how they're able to get on the floor and play with their grandchildren, or they were able to, you know, accomplish something in the gym they've never done before. It is, it is rewarding and fulfilling. And I think in medicine, we see a lot of burnout because it's just this chronic disease mill of, you know, prescribed medications, nobody gets better, people just get sicker. And so really, honestly, um, it, it is, it is a fulfilling thing for me day in and day out to do what I do. Uh, that, that's great. And so, look, I'm a little bit older and I've been at it for over 30 years and uh, I am not ready to throw in the towel. And um, I like to bring about change from inside. And, you know, yours is uh, a, a typical story, a healthcare professional that uh, discovered that they had their own health issues and, and on their own uh, went about to fix it. But on top of it, it's a typical story about uh, young athletes who believe that they're invincible and Lo and behold, they're they're great at their exercise and 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 they they excel, but they're metabolically unhealthy and 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 that really needs to be addressed and 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 you've done so. So uh, that's absolutely uh, fantastic. Well, and I think that you know we get away with a lot of things in our teens and our twenties. You know, from a lifestyle perspective, we just have more cellular resiliency. You know, we can we can get a lot get away with a lot of bad behavior. I mean, look at every college kid. They're drinking alcohol multiple times per week. They're eating Taco Bell. You know, maybe they're intermittently going to the campus gym and working out. But as we age, those things are going to catch all of us eventually. Um, and you know, thankfully, I caught it in my you know mid thirties, and it's it's changed the trajectory of my life. And I hope that somebody listening it will do the same for them. Yeah, well, that's great. I, I mean, I like to say that uh, longevity is an endurance sport. And mm -hmm. as we age, that's that's kind of where it's at. Now, you know, uh, you brought up the fact that you were insulin resistant. I was insulin resistant some 20 plus years ago, and I had lost 40 to 50 pounds and addressed it in that way. But uh, an interesting observation, and I'm sure you're well aware that uh, especially women, there's a, a, a subset of women that aren't at their ideal body weight, but they're actually insulin sensitive. When you measure their you know, glucose tolerance test, look at insulin levels, um, they don't quite have that metabolic issue that you and I were dealing with. And I guess the question is, uh, is the advice that you give those individuals the same or, or how is it different? Well, I think, you know, you bring up a good point when we think about obesity, you know, carrying extra body fat, you know, there, there's a small percentage of those patients that are actually metabolically healthy. I think that we live in a day and age where you scroll through Instagram and we have this idea in our head that these lean shredded people like that, that's what healthy is. And, um, there are ramifications on, on both extremes, especially in women, you can be too lean. Women are a reproductive species and we need a, not only essential amount of body fat, but it, you know, the, the healthy amount of body fat is definitely higher than the essential level. Um, and you can be a little bit, you know, over what we would consider normal and still be very metabolically healthy. Um, I'm a huge fan of body composition testing because I think in medicine, you know, we look at weight and we look at fat. Um, I know you had Dr. Lyon on the podcast and her and I are, uh, see very eye to eye on the fact that muscle is a metabolic organ and it's under recognized in medicine in the role that it plays in metabolic health. And I discovered that for myself, you know, stepping out of the gym for almost 10 years, developing prediabetes, you know, finally getting my nutrition to a place, but then realizing I had to get back in the gym. I had to work on building back lean body mass. If I really wanted to protect myself long-term, um, muscle is a protective organ, not only when it, I mean, it comes to everybody thinks of muscle as just looking fit, but if you want to fight insulin resistance, muscle is a great disposal agent for glucose. And if you're like me and you like to eat and you like to eat carbohydrates, then you, you want to have muscle. And so in these female patients, you know, that's one thing that I, that I really address with them is it's not about going to the gym and doing cardio and getting on the treadmill for long periods of time, but resistance training can be a strategy to fight insulin resistance. Um, 
you can lose weight a lot of ways. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to help your insulin resistance or improve your, you know, metabolic conditions. Jamie, that's great. I love you, you know, you're steering the conversation away from insulin resistance, but it's body composition and muscle centric health, like um, Dr. Lyon talks about. Yeah. And and I agree. And so next year at a conference, we're really bringing in a lot of the triple threats to discuss the importance of maintaining musculoskeletal health throughout life. And, uh, you know, look, we could go on, on all day. And I love how you say, uh, you know, women are reproductive species. And, you know, the, the next question I want to ask is, and you've already uh, addressed it is, you know, what is unique to the, the female in terms of metabolic health, nutrition, and fitness? Yeah. So it depends what age the woman is we're talking about. So let's review just a little bit, kind of the, you know, hormonal lifespan of women. So women go through puberty right? Sometime in their lower teenage years. And we start to see secretion of hormones from the pituitary gland, FSH, LH, they're stimulating our ovaries. We're making estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And we enter these years of fertility where we are cycling estrogen and progesterone for, you know, the span of, from our teens, usually until age 51, 52 on average, right? So, during these years, as we're cycling these hormones, when we talk about women's physiology, it's it's really hard to, you can't explain it in one PowerPoint slide. It's, it's so complex and there's so many things that affect it. It's just not as simple, you know, as, as men. It's as a reproductive species, these nutrient sensing pathways are a requisite for life, right? Because if a woman's body perceives stress, and when I say stress, the mitochondria, you know, when it perceives stress, it doesn't know if it's psychological, it doesn't know if it's emotional, it doesn't know if it's physical. What I mean by that, it, it doesn't know if you starved yourself for multiple days, or you had a strenuous hit workout, or your husband screamed and yelled at you. The, the, the cell perceives stress as stress, and a stress signal within the body will will start a cascade through these pathways that says, maybe it's not a good time to reproduce. This wouldn't be a good time to have offspring because the chances of survival would be lower, right? And so when we go through these years um, in the first part of the menstrual cycle, so we consider that basically the first day of bleeding for about 14 days, this is a, what we call follicular phase. So the ovary is getting an egg ready, and this is a more estrogen dominant part of the cycle. And in this part of the cycle, women are more insulin sensitive. Estrogen is a great hormone for women. Um, it sometimes gets a bad rap. You get on social media and hear about estrogen dominance and all this stuff. And, and that's its own conversation, but estrogen is a great hormone. It's why women actually live longer than men because we have more estrogen. And when we lose it, and we can talk about that, menopause, it's a bad deal when we lose estrogen. But during this, this two weeks, because you have more insulin sensitivity and because you have better recovery in the gym, the first two weeks is when you could be eating more targeted carbohydrates in the diet. Um, you can be going a lot harder in the gym, doing more high intensity interval training, trying to hit your personal records and weightlifting. This is the time to really go, go, go. And then once we ovulate, we enter the luteal phase. So after the egg is released, we enter luteal phase where we start to see uh, kind of the hormones drop and then progesterone starts to get produced. Progesterone is a pregnancy hormone. The body in this phase is anticipating a possible pregnancy in two weeks, essentially. And so this progesterone is slowing down the gut. It's creating more insulin resistance women will start to feel kind of more tired, more irritable, more fatigued. The body is telling you to, to rest essentially. And obviously not every woman wants to get pregnant every single month. Um, and the luteal phase is where we see most people's complaints, you know, about their menstrual cycle, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMS. Um, I'm having cravings. I can't control my diet. So this is the time of the cycle where you probably want to back off a little bit. Progesterone also loosens our ligaments and tendons a little bit. So maybe more low intensity. This is a great time if you're weightlifting to what we call deload, meaning take all the heavy weights off and just do more repetitions. 
And from a dietary perspective, the blood glucose becomes a lot more erratic. There's more insulin resistance. And so this is a time to really dial in the nutrition, um, focusing on controlling carbohydrates. It's not the time to eat excessive amounts of sugar um, and processed carbohydrates and things like that. And it will make patients feel better. Um, and then you start another period and the whole cycle starts over again. Um, now this is, of course, is just a menstruating woman. So if somebody is on any form of birth control that inhibits ovulation, which would essentially be a pill patch or a vaginal ring that contains both estrogen and progesterone. Um, if it's any of those types of birth control, that's, you're not having real periods and you're not having the cycle that I'm describing. Um, but in a menstruating woman, that's what's happening. It's, it's, it's very complex. And so, you know, to just prescribe one diet, you know, that, that works for everybody, there's, there's no such thing. We all make different amounts of estrogen and progesterone and, and all these things. And this of course is in a, a normal, healthy person that's menstruating every month. Yeah. So I understand that, um, if, if you have an estrogen, estrogen dominant state that, that that's part of PCOS. And so you know, the idea is that you you need the right balance in these particular hormones. And, you know, I did want to ask about birth control and contraception. We we have this delicate uh, balancing system. And, and the question is, you know, as a practicing um, gynecologist, you know, how do you deal with contraception with your patients? I'm, I'm sure you offer everything and anything that, that that's out there, but um, what, what, what say you about the, you know, birth control pill? Yeah. So, I mean, first off, thank, thank the Lord that we have modern medicine and that we have options when it comes to birth control. I'm a mom of three daughters and, um, I think it's great that we have lots of options. There's obviously pros and cons to all of these different options. And, um, we have to discuss those with each patient, what, what I would choose and what they would choose might be two totally different things. When it comes to the birth control, so hormonal birth control pills, a little bit about the history of, of birth control pills. Um, when they first came to market, they were very high dose and the estrogen in most birth control pills, well, I would say all of them, but there's some newer estrogens, uh, synthetic estrogens hitting the market now, but they were whopping doses of ethanol estradiol, which is way more potent than 17 beta estradiol, which is, which is what our body makes. But the extreme potency of the th of the ethanol estradiol is what turns off the pituitary gland from stimulating the ovaries. So it turns off the system and just puts everything basically at a steady state. So like I had mentioned earlier, this is a huge misconception is that you you don't actually have periods on the birth control pill. The pill manufacturers thought that women would want to feel normal. So they made these pills in either 24 or 21 day packs and then told patients to take a couple days off and they would bleed basically because of the withdrawal of the medication, the withdrawal of the progesterone in the medication would make them have a, have a period, but it's not a real cycle. And so pills can be taken continuously or they can be taken cyclically. Um, there are different dosages now. We have um, even low dose and ultra low dose uh, pills. And I, 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 this is my personal opinion. I think the, the lowest dose pill that's effective is what you should use. So there's 10 microgram pills out there and I'm a huge fan of them. Um, there's also progesterone only uh, oral contraceptives as well that you don't have to use ethanol estradiol in um, and lots of different progestins on the market as well, depending on what you're using them for. Some of them are anti-androgenic. So for your PCOS patients that have a lot of hirsutism and acne and dark hair growth, um, there's a new one on the market that has uh, progestin in it called drospirinone, which can really help with those symptoms. So, I mean, they're, they're, they are, they are birth control, but they are also used a lot medically for abnormal bleeding. And, and like I said, some of these hirsutism symptoms. And so, you know, that's another thing patients need to understand is sometimes they are used for non-birth control reasons. Um, but the ramifications of using them, let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, the liver, anything you ingest into your body, your liver has to metabolize. So these medicines go to our liver and they get metabolized through these pathways. So estrogen in particular goes through kind of what we call phase one, phase two, and phase three metabolism. And so if you're somebody where kind of your proverbial bathtub is kind of like clogged up and you put a lot of these extra things in there that it's having to metabolize, sometimes it can slow things down. Um, 
it also creates low level oxidative stress. We know that through studies, it's not talked about. I'm sure no OBGYN counsels anybody, but, but being on a birth control pill does cause some additional oxidative stress. Um, it can deplete your B vitamins, um, things like zinc, magnesium, and selenium. And so you really need optimized nutrition. If you're taking birth control pills, you need additional B vitamins, additional magnesium, um, when you're on these things. And that's something that not a lot of people think about. And it's probably the reason that people get, um, quote unquote side effects, you know, from these medications, probably through nutrient depletion, oxidative stress. Um, and then because it's turning off the, the normal cycle, you know, people can get, um, uh, different symptoms from that too. So, you know, I'm a fan of birth control. If people want birth control, there's other birth control that we didn't talk about. It could be an entire <laughs> podcast episode, mm -hmm. but we have to understand that these aren't just benign, you know, medications and, and there's, there's physiologic, you know, pros and cons to being on them. Sure. Jamie. Um, well, look, there's IUD hormones, maybe it bypasses the liver and look, there's, there's yeah. natural methods, there's barriers, withdrawal, those kinds of things. So I like that you offer all the options to the patients and, you know, that's what we do as well. So, um, PCOS, so, you know, this represents a hormonal imbalance. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and how testosterone plays into it? Yeah. So PCOS is really, you know, a spectrum. And I think the interesting thing is with the rise of insulin resistance, you know, 88% of the, the country having insulin resistance or metabolic disease of some kind, you know, I think that sometimes women get told they have PCOS when they really maybe just have insulin resistance um, and, and vice versa, right? So, so true PCOS, you have to have two out of three symptoms. So either no periods at all or, or inter, what we call oligomenorrhea, so intermittent periods. Um, you have to have hyperandrogenism. So you, you have dark hair growth or acne or biochemically we've drawn your blood and you have high DHEA, testosterone uh, in your blood. And then, of course, the third one is polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Now, a lot of patients come in and say, oh, I went to the ER one time and I have, I def I have cysts on my ovaries. <laughs> the ovaries make cysts every single month. That is their job. So it is normal to see cysts on the ovaries. Patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome have tons of these tiny little primordial follicles around the, the edge of the ovaries. And, and these follicles are not maturing into normal follicles that ovulate. Um, they're not doing what a normal ovary is supposed to do. And these tiny little follicles are making lots of testosterone because actually your estrogen is actually made locally into testosterone and then it's converted into estrogen. And so what's happened, what happens in these patients is they make lots of testosterone. That's also getting converted into estrogen. So they have lots of testosterone and lots of estrogen, but this hormonal imbalance is kind of turning off the system. And so the ovulation's never happening, the progesterone production's never happening, the period's never happening, and all this extra estrogen and testosterone um, is, is driving insulin resistance at the level of the ovary, and it's causing the hair growth, and it's causing the acne, and it's causing, uh, you know, it's driving their or obesity. Not all of them are obese, but, but many are. Um, they have trouble losing weight, they're not sleeping well, they have higher rates of depression, and um, it's, it's a, a common reason for infertility as well. So when we think about, you know, what the treatment is because of the complaints, a lot of these patients have, a lot of them get placed on birth control pills. Now, if they're not trying to get pregnant, um, it can be a way to protect their endometrium because without the cycle, excessive estrogen, uh, stimulation of the endometrium does increase the risk of hyperplasia and cancer. Um, so, so birth control pills can help with that. Um, it also, it also will get quote unquote, right. They think they're having a cycle. Sometimes they make it think they, they think it's giving back their cycle. Mm. The pill also increases something called sex hormone binding globulin, which can help bind up a lot of this free testosterone, which is driving a lot of their, uh, uh androgen symptoms. And so it can help in that regard too, but it's not really fixing, you know, it's not, um, it's not extinguishing the fire <laughs> per se, because as soon as they come off the birth control pill, they're likely to have a lot of the same symptoms. Um, sometimes it can even be worse. So from my standpoint, if they need birth control, that's one thing. Let's give them birth control if they need it. But from my standpoint, it starts with lifestyle. So 
nutrition is the number one intervention in this situation. We have studies, they're not large, but we definitely have studies looking at low carb ketogenic Mediterranean diets for patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which have been shown um, to restore normal FSH LH balance, to reduce their testosterone levels, to restore ovulation. Some of the patients got pregnant in these trials. Um, it, it helps across the board. It also lowers their blood pressure, restores their lipid imbalance, lowers their fasting glucose and insulin and A1C. And it is the first intervention. Most doctors aren't trained or equipped with the tools to help patients um, in, in that regard, but it really should be the primary intervention in my opinion. Um, from an exercise perspective, they have extra testosterone, which is a great way to build muscle. So thankfully for these patients, they usually have great stamina in the gym. So if you can get these patients in the gym, doing some resistance training, um, uh, listen, I was told I had PCOS before, um, I had to use metformin to get pregnant with my first daughter. And I've always had a very athletic, you know, body type and body image can be a huge issue for these patients because they do tend to have more muscle. They do tend to look more athletic. Um, if you, if you look at a lot of actually high level female athletes, um, a lot of them have been told they've had PCOS in their lifetime. I mean, we're talking Olympic athletes, collegiate athletes. So, um, I really empower them to, Hey, listen, this is, this is the tools you've been given. Let's, let's use it. But, but that can be really helpful for them as well. Um, sleep can be important because poor sleep drives insulin resistance. So, you know, if they're like, night shift worker or college kid or whatever it is, figuring out how to get a normal circadian rhythm for them can help also with their insulin resistance. Great, Jamie. Look, I, you're, you're doing a great job answering these questions. I don't know how we thought we could get through all this in 45 minutes, <laughs> but I'm going to keep going if you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. So I think that women are unique in that PCOS and pregnancy are kind of tests of insulin resistance early on. And, and men don't necessarily uh, have a, a test earlier in life. And, and perhaps that's what makes uh, women unique. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So <laughs> pregnancy is, uh, pregnancy is like a window to your future. It is a, it is the greatest physiologic stress test that you can put somebody under. Um, the energy requirements of pregnancy are at the levels of like the most extreme workout you've ever done from a, from a cellular metabolic perspective, what's happening during pregnancy. And so a lot of times in pregnancy problems that pre-existed prior to conception are going to get the bandaid ripped off during pregnancy. And when we think about, you know, what are the, what are the pathologic conditions that I deal with as an obstetrician? Uh, well, worldwide, women die from hemorrhage in childbirth. But in the United States, we're very good at treating hemorrhage. And my dogs agree. Um, in the United States, we're good at treating uh, the hemorrhage. So that's not what women die of. What women die of in the United States is preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Now, when I went through my medical training, obviously, we know the risk factors for these things. It's women who are obese, women who are hypertensive prior to pregnancy, women who have insulin resistance, diabetes, gestational diabetes, women who have metabolic disease are at a higher risk for this. But we would also see women that didn't have those things that would, I mean, it, I feel like these days we see preeclampsia and gestational hypertension just like left and right. And when I kind of went down, you know, this path, uh, you know, my own path and, and really started to look at a lot of literature, specifically pregnancy literature, hyperinsulinemia drives preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. The doggies are fine. <laughs> and so um, when you talk about blood glucose control in pregnancy, women's bodies at in the first trimester when you get pregnant, the pancreas starts putting out 30% more insulin almost in instantaneously. So we already have more insulin being dumped into the system. As pregnancy progresses, physiologic insulin resistance starts to occur. And this is by design. This is right. the body's way of ensuring that there is a free highway of glucose and fatty acids available to that baby. Basically, it takes anything it needs from the mom to, to grow this human life. 
And so this physiologic insulin resistance occurs through a couple of hormones made through the placenta. And unfortunately, if a woman's eating a lot of carbohydrates, um, especially a lot of processed carbohydrates that don't have, you know, they're not packaged with fat or protein, it's going to exacerbate this hyperinsulinemia. And you'll find women that pass their glucose test. But we always have to ask, and this is the question that um, is not even asked in a lot of research studies, is if the woman has a normal glucose level, that is at the cost of what amount of insulin? Because the body can make an insane amount of insulin to make the glucose levels normal, um, but that's still a problem. The fact that it took 100 insulin instead of 10 is, is a difference when it comes to hypertensive disorders, preeclampsia, these, these things that I'm talking about. And so, um, this is the, this is what I'm always thinking about. You know, when I'm, when I'm treating patients is how do we maintain physiologic levels of insulin and glucose in pregnancy to protect the mom and the baby from long-term conditions? And it's not just that, oh, she has a, you know, gestational hypertension stamped on her chart. You know, um, it's not like a, you know, a good check, bad check there are epigenetic changes happening. So what's happening inside a pregnant woman's body as we are literally programming the fetal DNA, this epigenetic programming is happening. And we know that women who have hyperinsulinemia uh, and hyperglycemia in pregnancy, their fetuses have an increased risk over their lifetime of diabetes, obesity, and these chronic diseases. So unfortunately, it's, it's not just, oh, we got her through the pregnancy. She passed all her tests. Um, we're literally changing what's going to happen in her family for decades to come. And that's why I'm so passionate about what I do, because if we can get healthier women having healthier babies, we're talking about, you know, really changing the health trajectory for, for a long time. So the nutritional requirements will be different for the individuals. So some people, some of the uh, pregnant women may develop gestational um, diabetes, gestational hypertension. So uh, how, how do you alter nutrition in, in those situations? Well, when we think about what pregnant women eat, you know, what is required from a nutritional, you know, perspective to grow a human life, there are minimum requirements of both fat and protein, period. Now, when it comes to carbohydrates, they're, even the Institute of Medicine says right on there, carbs are non-essential for human life given adequate protein and fat consumption. And that basically means that our body has the ability to make carbohydrates from protein and fat substrates, from glycerol and uh, uh, from those things. Does that mean that we should eat no carbs? No, that's not the answer. But the, the real thing is that we need to eat the amount we need and, and no more than that. And I think that we're still trying to figure out where that number is. The Institute of Medicine says it's not less than 175 grams in pregnancy, but I'll tell you right now, treating gestational diabetic patients with low carb intervention, um, sometimes we are required to reduce dietary carbohydrates lower than that, um, to avoid the use of, of insulin and other insulin sensitizing agents. And these patients have had pregnancy outcomes that have been beautiful. We've been able to control it. Um, but I do think that there's women that may need less than that. Um, but it's basically finding that threshold and then titrating it down to, to normal, to normal numbers. And if you look at our current guidelines, that's not what it says. It says, give them gliburide, give them metformin and really quick. They want people to be quicker about giving insulin. And when you think about what I just said, how hyperinsulinemia drives these diseases, giving them more insulin is pouring gasoline on the fire. Well, I wish we had more obstetricians like you here in Colorado. And often, uh, you know, we have some great OBGYNs here in town, right, right in our building. And uh, we end up seeing them uh, in the aftermath. So they had gestational diabetes yeah. or, uh, and, and they had weight issues. And so, uh, excellent. Thank you for discussing the topic. So we're going to jump ahead. And so uh, kind of go past where you're at. You're busy raising the family. Hopefully you and Ben are not fighting that much and life is good and you're finding some time and balance, uh, some mindfulness. And we're moving along and the kids are now getting older and, um, um, you know, you become the empty nester. 
And now we're going to talk a little bit about menopause. And I'd like to preface that by just saying that I really like the an ancestral approach in terms of um, sex hormones. And as we age and, um, you know, we, we get past the, the, uh, the reproductive age and from an ancestral perspective, we're, uh, nobody cares. But we do care because we, we live a long time. And so how do the sex hormones play into it as we age? Well, when we think about aging, actually, in women, uh, the ovarian, the, the rate at which the ovaries age actually paces a lot of aging for women. Because when you think about aging and you think about the ovaries, right, menopause, which the clinical definition is no periods for 12 months, um, menopause is basically that point in time where we see accelerated aging because the loss of estrogen um, changes our physiology. And we can talk about uh, specifically what I'm, what I'm talking about there because we know that with a loss of estrogen, um, gene transcription changes within our mitochondria. With the loss of estrogen, we have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes because we have an increase in insulin resistance. Um, this is naturally a time where women are starting to lose their lean body mass. A lot of women go, there was actually an Instagram post recently that the comment section just got out of control. It was talking about how basically our metabolism doesn't go down after menopause and it doesn't. Um, but it's the loss of estrogen and the loss of lean body mass that tips the scale where most women feel like they instantaneously gain 10 to 15 pounds specifically around their midsection, because we see an increased deposition of visceral fat. So fat starts depositing around the organs instead of, you know, in the subcutaneous tissue. I mean, it goes there too. Um, but this loss of estrogen causes these major physiologic changes. And if you are not eating a healthy diet, not sleeping well, you're super stressed out, you're drinking wine multiple times per week, um, this is, this is going to hit you, you know, pretty profoundly. And so unfortunately, I think that women in perimenopause, so before you hit this menopausal window, really needs to start to have a strategy for getting your nutrition in a place, in a good place, you know, figuring out ways to train, uh, resistance training, not cardiovascular training. I mean, cardio is great. I'm not going to tell you to not go take a jog if you want to take a jog, but with the loss of estrogen, you're going to start losing your muscle and losing your bone mass. And when, you know, for me, this whole hard to kill mentality, you know, if you want to think about the things that are most likely to kill you and make you miserable, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, right. But we think of things like osteoporosis. And if you fall and break a hip after the age of 65, the chance of you getting out of the hospital or not dying is like, <laughs> the numbers are scary. So you want strong bones and strong muscles and a strong body. So basically the, the loss of this estrogen that happens at menopause, um, you also lose progesterone. You don't necessarily lose all your testosterone, um, but we do, we have kind of seen this epidemic of low testosterone in both men and women. Um, it is a big deal and it causes a lot of changes. Now, what most women also come in complaining about is hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness. My skin is changing. My hair is changing. That's because we have estrogen receptors everywhere. I mean, we have them in our skin, in our vagina, um, absolutely everywhere. And so you, you will notice lots of changes. There's also a 30% reduction in brain energy with the loss of estrogen and menopause. So women feel brain fog. Their, they, their cognition is slowing down. Um, we know there's an increased risk of dementias that happen with the loss of estrogen as well. Um, I am a, I'm a big fan of hormone replacement therapy for, for the right patients. Now it is not magical in the sense that it is not going to make you 25 again, but it can get hot flashes and night sweats to go away. Um, it can improve vaginal symptoms it protects your uh, bone mass, it protects your heart and your brain, but there's definitely a golden window of opportunity and that is 10 years pre and post menopause. So once you go through menopause, those next 10 years strategically are the best time for hormone replacement therapy. Um, there are some patients that take it outside that window, um, but that is something that people should consider and talk about the you know risks and benefits with your provider. 
Well, I'm glad you brought up the the 10 year mark issue. And I was going to specifically mention the landmark uh, study from WHI in 2002, uh, which first got misinterpreted and they said, don't take hormone replacement. But then they, they retracted and said, okay, you can take hormone replacement for 10 years. But so we have some functional uh, people that, that, have now made the argument that bioidentical hormones and delivery of the hormones, whether whether it's topical or vaginal, uh, doesn't offer uh, the concerns regarding breast cancer and uterine cancer. And so uh, to my point of the ancestral approach, uh, you know, what do you think about going beyond 10 years with hormone replacement? Well, let me talk about the breast cancer thing for one second. So in the studies, the only time they've ever seen an increased risk of breast cancer is when a patient is taking a progestin, which is a synthetic progesterone. So if you have a uterus and you take estrogen, you have to take progesterone with it from a hormone replacement therapy standpoint. Um, and so your options are a synthetic progestin. So this is like norethindrone acetate uh, or something along those lines, medroxyprogesterone acetate, or you can take micronized progesterone, which is more quote unquote natural, bioidentical. They have not seen an increased risk of breast cancer in patients taking micronized progesterone. So if you have a uterus and you're taking estrogen, you should take a mic- micronized progesterone. 200 milligrams is what's needed to protect the endometrium. Um, we, we don't see an increased risk of breast cancer. Now, there, there is a small increased risk in all users. Um, that risk is very low. A couple per thousand women taking it. But when you look at risk of breast cancer, alcohol use, poor sleep, obesity, all of these things are significantly higher risk. So if you're talking about risk strategy of prevention of breast cancer, go for the big hitters, you know, be at a normal body weight, don't drink alcohol, uh, you know, reduce chemical exposure. There's lots of other things. Um, When it comes to years of use, I mean, I have patients (laughs) in their 60s and 70s that still take it. And they're like, listen, I, you know, I, I've re- I do all the right things. I eat right. I'm exercising. I might live to be 100 years old. I completely understand what my risks are, you know, and I don't want to go off therapy. Or there are a small percentage of women that continue to have vasomotor symptoms for 20, 30 years. And so if you take away their estrogen and start giving them hot flashes again at, you know, age 70, they're not going to be very happy with you. So I think there, you know, are women that probably still benefit beyond that 10 year window. But I think a lot of the 10 year window is probably, you know, when we look at the average lifespan of people, it's what, like mid seventies these days in the United States. And so if you're talking about somebody that is, you know, let's say they went through menopause at 53, 10 years of use, now they're 63. Okay. Maybe they're probably 10 years away from their average you know, time of death. And so as you get closer to that mark, it's always the question of, is this providing benefit? Is this really extending life? Is it adding quality of life? You know, are there more harms to taking it now, you know, or not? Um, The risk of blood clot and stroke is only seen with oral estrogens, not with transdermal. So like an estrogen patch or something given like sublingual or through the vagina. Um, So people should understand that too. Yeah. And we didn't even discuss... Uh, the benef- the cardiovascular benefits of hormone replacement. Yeah, so it's not a indicated use. Um, it's not an indicated use for cardiovascular prevention, osteoporosis prevention, or dementia. But um, estrogen um, is, although we talk about risk of blood clot and stroke, um, the cardiovascular system loves estrogen. Your heart loves estrogen. Your blood vessels love estrogen, um, and it's it's protective to our cardiovascular system. And so. With the loss of estrogen, we see um, an accelerated rate of atherosclerosis, um, hardening of the arteries, hypertension. Um, And so um, it, it it is something to consider when it comes to cardiovascular health, because that is the number one killer of women. It is, you know, we're seeing, we're actually seeing improvements in cancer detection and treatment. And so among women, heart disease is the number one killer. Great, Jamie. Well, listen, we're we're really doing well. Are you? Are you? I hope you're still enjoying the conversation. <laughs> yeah, we're doing good. I probably got ten minutes. Yeah, that's well, probably I'm, my hard stop. 
I'm going to I'm going to hit my last topic here, but I just wanted to say that, you know, in men, we see a deterioration in testosterone and, you know, the hormonal changes aren't quite as uh, significant compared to, to the women. But a lot of times the men want to just blame low testosterone on aging, but it's the same factors. You have to look at metabolic health in them as well. Yep, exactly. So, you know, um, like a common thing in men is, you know, uh, obesity and alcohol use cause a, what we call aromatization of testosterone into estrogen. And so it can increase this enzyme called aromatase. And so a lot of the reasons that men have poor testosterone production are the, are the same, you know, things in women. So not getting sunlight, not getting a good diet, um, not exercising, um, all of these things definitely impact that. Yeah. So anyway, our last topic is uh, metabolic health and sexuality. And so, you know, we see a lot of men and women that uh, just can't enjoy intimacy and they want a pill, a fix. And uh, we try to convince them that, that they need to look at the big picture. So what do you think about that? Yeah. So of course, you know, I don't treat men, but when we think about, you know, what is required for arousal and orgasm and, and intimacy, um, we need blood flow to the pelvic organs. So anything that affects our blood vessels, like the blood vessels in our heart can affect our pelvic floor in women, um, you know, circulation to the vulva and to the clitoris. And then in men, of course, it, you know, it, it seems more physically obvious when you deal with something like erectile dysfunction. Um, but women can have the same problems. If you have microvascular disease in your blood vessels, they don't dilate, you can't get good flow in there. Um, then you can have problems with, with arousal. Um, in women, the uh, changes that we discussed in menopause are a common time for women to experience a lot of sexual dysfunction, especially pain um, with, uh, with intercourse because estrogen provides the lubrication and uh, the, the plumpness and elasticity to the tissue in the vulva and in the vagina. And so <clears throat> our conversation about hormone therapy Vaginal estrogen is very safe and very effective for all patients. Even breast cancer patients can be on low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy. Um, and it not only helps with sexual function, um, lubrication of the vagina, it decreases urinary tract infections um, and other uh, problems associated with, with um, atrophy of this tissue after menopause. And I, it's so funny because female patients, unless you specifically ask about some of these things, a lot of times they won't even bring it up. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sexual health, it can be kind of this taboo topic. People, you know, it's usually like they don't want it on the front of their chart when they come in the come in the office. But if we bring it up as providers, um, these are problems that people are suffering with and it can start to affect relationships. Um, it can start to affect marriages, um, especially if there's not good communication between these partners. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, optimizing sexual function, so for women, um, you know, proper nutrition, um, cause it helps protect our, you know, uh, blood vessels and, and things like that. Um, exercise, when we think about the pelvic floor, just like you would go to the gym and work your bicep, the pelvic floor is made up of connective tissue and muscle. And so sometimes people can have pelvic floor disorders, men and women, men have a pelvic floor too. And so if your bicep is atrophied, sometimes your pelvic floor needs help with strengthening. And so I, I utilize pelvic floor physical therapists a lot in my practice. Um, and, and then of course, hormone optimization. So, you know, we need adequate testosterone and estrogen for sexual function. Um, and, and definitely there's a time and a place, like we said, for hormone replacement therapy, but there's, there's, there's no magic out there. A lot of times it is multifactorial. Great, Jamie. And I know I've heard you talk about that there's an inequity between pleasure and orgasm compared to men and women. We don't really have time to go into it. But yes, I agree that uh, talking about sexual health in our patients is often a faux pas and people are embarrassed to talk about it. But you warm up to the patient. It, it is important uh, uh, lifelong. And you know, as you know, uh, age doesn't necessarily matter in terms of uh, intimacy and enjoying the partner that you're with. Yeah, I mean, when it, yeah, you're you're referencing the orgasm gap. When you have arousal and orgasm, you release a really large amount of oxytocin, which is a social bonding hormone. And connection 
deep human connection is extremely important for our health. And, um, we know that women that have more orgasms actually ha- live longer. They have less disease. And so this is, this is an important thing that, you know, we've really stigmatized a lot in our world. And as a mom of three, gr- three girls, I mean, I talk about it really openly on social media and, uh, because I, I think we start, we need to start having a, you just a more open conversation about it. Patients shouldn't be afraid to bring up these topics. Um, providers shouldn't be afraid to, to talk about these topics either. Um, it's, it's, it's human, it's human nature. And, um, there's, there's definitely a lot of people out there that need help. Well, feel free to discuss a little bit of that at the conference. <laughs> All right. We'll do. Yeah. So just real quick, uh, what do you enjoy about coming to these events in person? Well, I think it's just so, uh, you know, rewarding and fulfilling to be around a lot of like-minded individuals that, you know, come from all these different specialties and different areas and, and to, to hear and to learn from them. And, and just the collaboration at these events, I think is, is so incredible for me. Great. And how can people find out more about you? Well, they can come to any of my social media channels at Dr. Fit and Fabulous. I've got a website, www.drfitandfabulous.com. And um, I'll see everybody in Denver in February. Great. And to our audience, if you want to hear more from uh, Dr. Seaman and the rest of our speakers, uh, please consider visiting and attending in uh, February. And for more information about our conference, please visit lowcarbconferences.com. So that's all for now, Doc. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, we'll stay in touch.